Father, thank you so kindly for uh, another night to come together as your kids, your believers. We thank you for the opportunity to study the Bible together. We ask that you make it clear to us that we understand what needs to be understood, what God is relevant for us. Let us hold on to it. What's not, let it just fly with the wind. And God, I thank you that our hearts will be open, our minds will be open tonight as we study the Word of God together. In Jesus' name, and you say amen. amen. Open your Bible to Revelation 15. We're going to read two chapters all the way through, uh, so just listen to it. <clears throat> and uh, we're about seven chapters away from the finality where we're going in the future. Uh, the classes to come are going to get very interesting as we talk about the ending of the kingdom of the devil. And we talk about God's coming to rule and reign on earth. And we talk about heaven, what eternity is going to be like, what we'll be doing in eternity from what most people think that will be angels with wings floating around in the clouds, uh, that kind of thing. We're going to look at all of that. What does the Bible say about eternity? How do we make it into eternity? So uh, definitely encourage you to come in these final lessons that we do. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed the probably 18 weeks we've dug in so far. It's been fun. It's been challenging for me, but I hope it's been a blessing to you. Let's read Psalm, uh, Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw in heaven another marvelous event of great significance. Seven angels were holding the seven last plagues which would bring God's wrath to completion. And I saw before me what seemed to be a glass sea mixed with fire. And on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. They were all holding harps that God had given them. And they were singing the song of Moses, the sermon of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, and all nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. And then I looked and I saw the temple in heaven. God's tabernacle was thrown wide open. The seven angels who were holding the seven plagues came out of the temple. They were clothed in spotless white linen with gold sashes around their chests. And then one of the four living beings handed one of the seven angels a gold bowl filled with the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from God's glory and power. No one could enter the temple until the seven angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues. Chapter 16. And I heard a mighty voice from the temple say to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. So the first angel left the temple and poured out his bowl on the earth. And horrible, malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and worshipped his statue. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea and it became like the blood of a, of a corpse and everything in the sea died. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs and they became blood. And I heard the angel who had authority over the water saying, You are just, O holy one, who is and who always was because you've sent these judgments. Since they shed blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them the blood to drink. It is their just reward. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, Yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. And the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat, and they cursed the name of God, who had control over all these plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores, but they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and it dried up so that the kings from the east could march their armies toward the west without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap up from the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out into all the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on the great judgment day of God, the Almighty. Look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and their armies to a place with the Hebrew name Armageddon. 
And the seventh angel poured out his bowl in the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne in the temple, saying, It is finished. And then the thunder crashed and rolled, and the lightning flashed, and the great earthquake struck the worst since people were placed on the earth. The great city of Babylon split into three sections, and the cities of many nations fell into heaps of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins, and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island disappeared, and all the mountains were leveled. And there was a terrible hailstorm, and hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the humans below. And they cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstones. Can you say amen to the reading of the word? Amen. Let's look at, if we will, chapters 15 and 16. And here's the thought of the night. <clears throat> the finality of God's judgment is now on the kingdom of humans and Satan, bringing ultimate fulfillment of God's promises to his people. One thing it's easy to forget is that God does judge. I know we live in a land, especially in America, we live in a land where we want retribution ourselves. We, we want to get even with people. People, you know, they get what's coming to them, we would say in the South. Well, he got what's coming to him. She got what's coming to him. And uh, do it unto me, I do it unto you. But there is a concept that's in every human that's put in there by God that all humans, whether you believe in God or not, we believe in retribution. We believe that justice needs to be done. Every culture has it. Every culture believes in it, that if you do wrong, you pay a price. And whatever that price would be in the culture, from stoning to murder to, uh, you know, the mafia may knock you off and kill you. Uh, uh, America will put you in jail, put you in prison, whatever. But, but that, that feeling of retribution is given to us by God as humans because God himself will judge. And the beauty of where we are, and I'll try to teach you this tonight, the beauty of where we are right now is the judgment of God has been held off. The judgment of God has been held off because of Jesus Christ. And the judgment of our sins was placed upon Jesus Christ. And we're told in the scripture that if we believe in Jesus, we put our faith in Jesus, that we miss the judgment of God because he's judged the Son. But to those that continually reject Jesus, to those that continually say no, I don't need God in my life. I don't want God in my life. I don't want to serve God. I want to serve me. I want to live my life my way. I don't care what God thinks. Uh, in a strange way, without sounding rude, according to what we read, there is a, a time coming where God will exact vengeance. And God will bring about the justice upon everything of every sin that's ever been done. And those humans have to pay the price. So what I'd like to do tonight is teach you, uh, you know, kind of what we've been saying all along, that God deals with the church, the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's dealing with all of them. But we're moving into scripture now where it's an identification that his wrath has come. And this is it. We're, we're, we're sliding into home plate. What is about to happen over the next few chapters is the end of everything the devil's been working for. It is the end of sin. It's the end of rebellion. It's the end of Satan and his kingdom. And Jesus Christ is going to return and set up a kingdom and he'll rule and reign uh, over the kings of the nations of the world. And so I'd like to try to do it tonight in a way that may make sense of this thing of judgment and why uh, it, it's going to maybe make more sense at the end of what we just read. Back to Revelation 15. Here's verse 3. It's an interesting thought, but it's the, it says they were singing, these believers that were around the throne of God were singing a song uh, and it was the song of Moses is the actual identification of it uh, the power of music is 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 it, it shows us signs of testimony I, I make a joke about this all the time probably everybody in the room has an old song that you can remember and take you right back to where you were in the jungle club before you ever got born again and you heard Chuck Berry singing his tunes or for me, I hear a song, I can immediately go back to the 10th grade and a couple skating with a girl in the, you know, or in the rink when I hear the song, right? That's the power of music. Well, the, the interesting thing is, right before this unleashing of the worst judgment that the world has ever seen, the Bible will say, uh, we start out singing. 
which is a powerful thought that before judgment comes, there's going to be a chorus being sung called the Song of Moses, and then we're going to look at this one too, and the Song of the Lamb. Two songs are being sung, and if you know the lyrics to the songs, you, you kind of have a better understanding of what the next two chapters are all about, that God is not sneaking up on a group of people to do them dirty, and God's not coming to judge people because he's so ticked off at them. These two songs and the lyrics that they hold are going to open up to us that this is not some random act that God is doing, but this has been planned all along. And we're now at that time. I don't know if you've listened to a lot of music, but so many times we listen to things and we just kind of hum along, but we really don't know all the words. We're like, well, I never even knew that was the word, right? I sang a song for like 15 years. I sang the wrong lyrics the whole time until it, until it came on and people wanted to know what it was. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what Benny and the Jets and electric boots and a mohair suit. I have no clue. I just was singing, she's got electric boots and mohair suit and I read it in a magazine, yeah, you know, just... I felt like I knew the words, but I definitely didn't know the words. I was like, electric boobs? I don't even understand. What is that? You know? And I definitely didn't sing around my mother because I get in trouble. <laughs> and then when I really understood, I was like, dear God, I've been singing the wrong lyrics for years. Well, a lot of people try to figure out uh, the judgment of God, but the thing is, is he tells it to you in a lyric. He's going to tell you the judgment in the song, and you just got to know the song. Sad thing is we're not Jews, so we probably don't know the song. We've never sang it. Uh, we've picked out courses of it. But So let's look at it. It's two places in the Bible. So let's go back to the Old Testament, and let's pick up this thing called the Song of Moses. Now to understand the Song of Moses, you just have to have an understanding of Moses. Moses was called by God to deliver the Israelites from bondage in Egypt. And if you remember the story, Moses splits the water and all the people come walking out. And in that, in Exodus 15, we pick up the song. This is the first mention of the song of Moses. Now we're going we're gonna to actually go through the lyrics of the song in a minute, but I'll just read some verses and then we'll jump in. All who live in Canaan will melt away. Terror and dread will fall upon them. The power of your arm makes them lifeless as stone until your people pass by, O Lord, until the people you purchase pass by. You will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain place. So already the song is definitely talking about there's been a people that has been purchased by God, but he's going to bring them to a mountain and then this phrase, and the Lord will reign forever and ever. So already the lyrics of the song, we just kind of pulled a few of them out. The lyrics of the song begin to talk about God is going to do something. Here it is in Deuteronomy. It's the preparation. It's kind of the prelude to the song. This is what God says to Moses. The Lord said to Moses, you're about to die. And join your ancestors. And after you are gone, these people will begin to worship foreign gods, the gods of the land where they're going. They will abandon me and break my covenant that I've made with them. They, then my anger will blaze forth against them and I will abandon them, hiding my face from them, and they will be devoured. Terrible trouble will come down on them. On the day they will say, these disasters have come down on us because God is no longer among us. So there's this sense of that this song that is about to be written is going to be written from a place of deliverance out of judgment. They've come out of being judged by God and God is talking to them about how rebellious they've been and how rebellious they are. And then the next verse is this. And at that time I will hide my face from them on account of all the evil they commit by worshiping other gods. Now listen, this is God. <laughs> So write down what? The words of the song. And teach it to who? All right, so I go back to that revelation is primarily about the people of Israel, not the church. The very song that they're singing, the song of Moses, was written to teach the people of Israel something. They were to learn something about God's nature uh, when they sang it. And then he even tells us what they are to learn. They are to learn so that it will serve as a witness for me against them. So every time they sing this song, it's going to serve as a reminder that they're going to be punished for their rebellion. 
And so God just says in the nicest way uh, to Moses, I want you to write down the words of this song, Deuteronomy 31, for I'm going to bring them. Here we go again. It's starting to be prophetic. I'm going to bring them into this land that I swore to give to their ancestors, a land flowing with milk and honey. There they will become prosperous. They'll eat all the food they want. They'll become fat. Come on, somebody. But they will begin to worship other gods. They will despise me. And here it is again in relationship to his covenant. And when the great disaster comes down on them, here it is. This song will stand as evidence against them. And it will never be forgotten by their descendants. Because I know the intentions of the people even now before they even entered the land. I already know what's going on with them. So God, this song of Moses that shows up, here's what's weird, it shows up in Exodus 15, the first time it's ever penned. It shows up again in Revelation 15 being sung in heaven. And what we start finding out about the lyrics of the song, they were asked to be pinned down by Moses from God to Moses to serve as a witness of God's wrath and their rebellion so that they would know that the song that they're singing is evidence that they have turned their back on God. So when they start singing the song of Moses in Revelation 15, here's what we can start understanding. What is about to happen in the chapters ahead is going to be the wrath of God because God's people has, have turned their back on Him. And they're going to start out singing the song as a reminder to all the descendants of Israel to come that God promised this would happen. So what's going to come in Revelation 16 that we read is a promise of God. Turn in your Bible, if you don't mind, to Deuteronomy 32, if you will. <clears throat> I would like to just read some of the lyrics of the song if you've never heard it. So... It's definitely different than the kind of music we write today with a chorus and a verse and a bridge and a really cool guitar lick. <clears throat> um, this is the end of chapter 31. Verse 30 says, So Moses recited the entire song publicly to the assembly of who? Israel. So there again, I believe that the judgments to come are specifically going to come to the nation of Israel, not the church. Because this is the song they begin to sing. It's a long song. It doesn't even feel like it would be a song. But just listen to it. Listen, O heavens, verse 1. And I will speak, hear, O earth, the words that I say. Now remember, this is the song they're singing before the judgment comes. So this is the song being sung in heaven. Let my teaching fall on them like rain. Let my speech settle like dew. Let my words fall like rain on the tender grass. Like gentle showers on plants, I will proclaim the name of the Lord. How glorious is our God. He is the rock. His deeds are perfect. Everything he does is just and fair. In other words, we're reading Revelation 16 going, how terrible this is. The blood, the, the upheaval of earth. And God starts out singing what you're about to see. All the stuff that's coming in the later chapters of Revelation. God, by pinning a song, tells us, don't think that I'm angry here. This is just and fair. In other words, you're getting what's coming to you. I'm going to do what you deserve. So this song is doing that. It goes on in verse 5. But they have acted corruptly toward him when they act so perversely. And they, and they really, are they really his children? They are a deceitful and twisted generation. In this way you pay the, repay the Lord, you foolish and senseless people. Isn't he your father who created you? Has he not made you and established you? Remember the days long ago. Think about the generations past. Ask your father and he will inform you. Inquire of your elders and they will tell you. When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, when he divided up the human race, he established boundaries of the people according to the number of his heavenly court. For the people of Israel belong to the Lord. See, the song is very much a Jewish song. The people of God. Uh, Jacob is his special possession. He found them in a desert land, in an empty and howling wasteland. He surrounds them and watches over them. He guarded them as he would guard his own eyes. Like an eagle that rouses her chicks and, and hovers over her young, he spread his wings and has taken them up and carried them safely on his pinions. 
The Lord alone guided them. They followed with no foreign gods. He let them ride over the highlands and the feast of the crops of the fields. He nourished them with honey from the rock and olive from the stony ground. He led them, he fed them yogurt from the herd and milk from the flock together with the fat. He gave them the choice rams of Bashan and goats together. How would you like to learn the lyrics of this song, right? <laughs> he, he drank the finest wine and he gave them juice from grapes. But Israel soon became fat and unruly. The people grew heavy, plump, and stuffed. Then they abandoned the God that made them. They made light of the rock of their salvation. They stirred up his jealousy by worshiping foreign gods. They provoked his fury with detestable deeds. They offered sacrifices to demons which are not gods, to gods they had not known before, to new gods and only recently arrived, to God of their ancestors had never feared. You neglected the rock who fathered you. You forgot the God that gave you birth. And the Lord saw this and, and drew back, provoked to anger by his own sons and daughters. He said, I will abandon them. Then see what becomes of them. For they are a twisted generation, children without integrity. They've roused my jealousy by worshiping things that are not God. They've provoked my anger with their useless idols. So I will rouse their jealousy through people who are not even people. I will provoke their anger through the foolish Gentiles. For my anger blazes forth like fire and burns to the depths of the grave. It devours, here we go, here comes the judgment. It devours the earth and all the crops, ignites the foundation of the mountains. I will heap disasters upon them and shoot them down with arrows. I will weaken them with famine, burning fever, deadly disease. I will send the fangs of wild beasts and poisonous snakes that glide in the dust. Outside the sword will bring death and inside terror will strike. Both young men and women, both infants and the aged. I would have annihilated them, wiping out even the memory of them. But I feared the tone of Israel's enemy who might misunderstand and say, Our own power has triumphed. The Lord had nothing to do with this. But Israel is a senseless nation. The people are foolish without understanding. Oh, that they were wise and could understand this. Oh, that they might, not, that they might know their fate. How could one person chase... We kind of take this out of context a lot. How could one person chase a thousand of them and two people put 10,000 to flight unless their rock had sold them, unless the Lord had given them up. But the rock of our enemies is not like our rock, as even they recognize. Their vine grows from the vine of Sodom and from the vineyards of Gomorrah. Their grapes are poison, clusters are bitter. Their wine is venom of serpents, the deadly poison of cobras. The Lord says, I'm not storing up these things, sealing them away in my treasury. I will take revenge. I will pay them back. In due time, their feet will slip. The day of disaster will arise and their destiny will overtake them. Indeed, the Lord will give justice to his people and he will change his mind about his servants. When he sees their strength is gone and no one is left slave or free. I'd continue to read, but it's a long, long, long song. Do you get the gist of the song? The gist of the song before the wrath of God is poured out is these people deserve it. And I know that sounds so crass and rude. I think it's what I said last week that the purpose of the church is so powerful because we can go out now and tell people about Christ Jesus. They can put their faith in Jesus and when they do they miss all of this. But when you consistently reject him, when you consistently say no, when you consistently live your own life, when you consistently do your own thing, God starts out with... We're going to sing the song of Moses. Here it is. It was a song penned by Moses whose lyrics served as a witness against God's people, the Jews. Again, why I think Revelation is primarily toward the Jewish nation in Israel. For their rebellious ways and their rejection of God's covenant, which in turn warranted the wrath of God. So as we get into this chapter, and maybe you read 16 and it sounds so gruesome, you need to go back and, and remember it all started with the pinning of a psalm that says, whatever you're about to read that is so gruesome is warranted. And I know that doesn't feel good, but God is going to avenge his wrath because of their rejection. Here's the second part of that. The song of Moses serves as a reminder 
that God is just to bring about His wrath upon those who failed to keep the law of His covenant. He's just to do it. It's no different than if somebody murders somebody and then we take them to court and they go to prison and they stay there for 30 years and we may say, I hope they rot in prison, they deserve it. Uh, I think the reality here of what God is teaching us is let's don't snub our nose at God and act like He's not fair to do this. He's told us from the beginning of time that sin deserves death and sin deserves punishment. And it's why the church and now preaching and telling people about Jesus is so important because if they believe, they get, to, they get to skip out on the wrath of God. Let's go back to Revelation 15, if you will. Jump back into the reading and let's pick up the Song of the Lamb. <clears throat> it's definitely shorter. How many of you glad Jesus shortened his words up? I definitely go to show you how the Old Testament can be full of a lot of religion. Uh, I don't know if I could learn the lyrics to 50 verses of a song. But the Song of the Lamb is a lot shorter. The Song of Moses was written for the Jews. You remember we talked about that there are groups of people that are left behind on the earth that are going through this period of time. The church is not here. And we found out that the Jews are left behind and the Gentiles are left behind. We saw last week that the believing Jews and the believing Gentiles are taken up to heaven to be with God so that the only remaining groups of people left on earth by the time we get to these chapters are Gentiles who don't believe in God, who are worshiping Satan, taking the mark of the beast, and then a group of Jews who are Orthodox who still don't believe Jesus is the Messiah and they're waiting on Him to come. And so God gives two songs. He gives a song of Moses for the Jews to know that what's happening is just and fair. But then he also, from the heavenly realm, sings the song of the Lamb. And here are the words and the lyrics. It's pretty short. We can get it on one, one screen. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true. There it is again. It, whatever this song is, it's a song of justice. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Again, we're, the song of the Lamb has to do with the nations, the Gentiles, those that are still here. Who will not fear you, Lord God, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. It speaks of the holiness of God. And now we start really understanding the song of the Lamb is that all nations will come and worship before you for his righteous deeds have been revealed. In other words, to the Gentile nations that have said, no way we'll ever let the Jews rule, no way we'll ever let Jesus come, we're going to kill them all, we're going to annihilate every Jew that's left on the planet, we're going to take over, Satan is going to rule. This song is sung so that the Gentile nations may know, as the Jews know, judgment is coming because of the land I promised you in your rejection, but the Gentiles are going to know that there is a king coming. And he's going to rule and reign from planet earth. So it's kind of like both songs are prophetically looking and speaking what is going to happen. Here is my take on the song of the Lamb and why it's so important. I went back and looked at the first place a lamb was ever mentioned in the Bible. And it's Genesis 4 with the, uh, with the sacrifice that Abel brings. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve. She became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. And she said, with the Lord's help, I've produced a man. And later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. And when they grew up, here it is, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. And then the word harvest, when it was time for the harvest. So the song of the lamb, as we sing it, when we go back and we really look at the first mention of a lamb, it comes as a sacrifice from a shepherd over a harvest when it's harvest time so one thing we're going to learn that's coming in the chapters ahead is there's coming a harvest God is going to harvest the grapes of wrath God is going to pour out his wrath he's going to harvest the earth he's going to own the earth and come and rule and then it says this in Genesis about Abel and Abel brought a gift the best portion of the firstborn of his lamb so we, we start understanding that a lamb was a sacrifice given to God and listen to what happened and the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You'll be accepted if you do what's right. But if you refuse to do what's right, and then watch how it connects the lamb to something really profound. Sin is crouching at your door, eager to control you. 
but you must subdue it and, you, and be its master. So anytime we, we want to talk about what the intention of this word lamb is, we cannot escape the fact that it's connected to a human and the sacrifice of a human to God to be accepted so that sin could be mastered. So while we're singing the song of the Lamb in the New Testament of Revelation 15 and we're singing that out and we're singing it, what we're really singing in the song of the Lamb and the lyrics is this, that there is a shepherd, his name is Jesus Christ, and his sacrifice that he offered was given to God and God accepted his sacrifice. And when God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus' blood, it put an end to the mastery of sin. So when they stand in heaven and they begin to sing the song of the Lamb, it goes out into the universe that there is quickly becoming an end to sin because not only is the wrath of God being poured out in the song of Moses, so also in the song of the Lamb there is coming the wrath on the kingdom of Satan that will put an end to all sin, giving people hope. So the song of Moses says there's wrath coming. The song of the Lamb says, but there's hope because there's going to be an end to sin. Lucifer will be locked away a thousand years into a dungeon. Just to connect the two, why the song of the Lamb? The next day, John 1, John saw Jesus coming and said, Look, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Come on, somebody. That is just powerful. He's the one I was talking about when I said a man is coming after me who's far greater than he existed before me. I did not recognize him as what? Yeah, the Messiah was for the Jew, not the Gentile. The Messiah was given for the Jew. It's, It's because the Jews rejected the Messiah that he becomes our Lord. And we're grafted into this family But he came as as the Messiah again to the Jews. So when they're singing the song of the Lamb, it is still, I kind of go back to it. it, Revelation is very much a Jewish book. It it is God fulfilling all of his covenants and his promises to his people about the land and about ruling and about the nations and about being a king. But you rejected me, so I'm going to judge you. And then because I I love you so much, I'm also going to judge the the enemy, Satan. And and so it all kind of plays out, and we read it and go, Oh, my God, I'm going to go through that. Oh, my God, it's the end of the world. But it's really not even about the church. For us that believe, it, it, it lends itself to this thinking. Here's the song of the Lamb. The song of the Lamb is the song sang by all the people who had been victorious over the beast, his statue and the number representing his name. So it's not just a song that we, the church, sing. It's a song that's sung because of the people that overcame the beast. I believe those that were left behind, those that were not part of the church, but they decided to believe later. They were beheaded. They were put to death. But they sing this song of victory. And here's the song of the Lamb. It serves as a reminder that God accepted the sacrifice of Christ and sin and sin's master would now be thrown to the lake of fire and Jesus would now finally rule the nations. Now those are the two songs that are the prelude to probably the worst chapter in the Bible. The seven plagues of his wrath that are poured out and the whole world just begins to be an upheaval. But the prelude is this, and this is again the prelude. The prelude is, I'm, I'm just to judge you because you rejected me. The prelude is, don't be ticked at me. I'm only doing what I told you I would do. If you reject me, you pay a high price. But I also want you to know that the rejection that you have is not just because I'm going to cleanse the earth. It's because I'm putting an end to sin and the enemy's kingdom and I'm going to come and rule and reign because I want to live with you face to face. So it's a judgment and a hope all written into two songs that kind of push the next chapter forward. Now, the only problem with that, in my take, how does God, the Father, who killed His Son for us, impaled Him on a cross, and the Son took our sins, and the Son stands in the heavenly realm and makes intercession for you and me, come on, that's an amen point there, that all your sins have been absolved in Jesus, 
It's not a man that absolves them. No priest absolves them. Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, is the one that absolves all your sins. When you believe in Him, you're washed white as snow. Everything you've ever done, everything you've ever ashamed of, everything you want to do it, you never have to be ashamed to come to God because of Jesus. You come freely. You say, I'm a sinner. He says, I know. Good. Glad you know. I totally forgive you. You owe me nothing. You're now my kid. And, and, and because of that, I get eternal life, which seems really unfair. That this old boy right here with all of his qualms and sins and failures could stand before a holy God and he says, I'm going to let you in because you believe. That just blows my mind. It touches my heart too that, that he would have that kind of love. Knowing how f- much I can fail him, but if he says, if I just believe in this sacrifice of Jesus... I've accepted Jesus, not you. And when you, watch now, when you accept Jesus, God accepts you because he's already accepted his son. That's the song of the Lamb. Now, here's the problem it poses. The problem it poses if Jesus has forgiven us and taken the wrath of God upon himself on the cross, then how could God do all this to us, to humans? If God is so loving and kind, How could he pour out wrath upon sinful mankind when he already poured it out on Jesus at the cross? It seems as if God is now kind of a house divided. Because what we teach is that all the wrath of God was put on the back of Jesus Christ. And if you believe in Jesus, all your sins are forgiven. Amen? I mean, that's our gospel. So how does God do Revelation 16? How does God allow these bowls to be dumped out of his wrath? It's not the devil doing this stuff. Revelation 16 is all God. It even said in the song of Moses, they'll try to say that it was done by man, but it wasn't. It was done by me. I'm the one doing it. I'm going to, that's weird. I'm going to take the credit for the disaster. It's me doing it. And so my, my theology head, it gets stuck. Like, how does God punished humans when he's already punished Jesus. But he has to because that's what scripture said. So I think I kind of got a, a worked it out a little bit. I'll give it to you for what I worked out. So let's go back to Revelation, if you will. If you don't mind turning to Revelation chapter 15 again toward the end. And, and my point is to try to explain if Jesus forgave us, then... How can wrath still come on humans if Jesus took it? So here's the scripture. Revelation 15, the final verses. The final three verses. And I looked and I saw, and here again, very Jewish. I saw that the temple in heaven, God's tabernacle, was thrown wide open. Now this temple and tabernacle is the same thing Moses built in the Old Testament where all the priests would come and sacrifice cows and goats and sheep for the sins of the nation of Israel. But that temple, tabernacle that Moses built was the exact replication of this one. Now we're not in the Old Testament, we're up in heaven and we're seeing it. And the seven angels who were holding the seven plagues came out of the temple They were clothed in spotless white linen with gold sashes across their chest. And one of the four living beings handed each of the seven angels a gold bowl filled with the wrath of God. Now here's where we have a problem. According to what Scripture teaches us, all the wrath of God has been staved off because of the sacrifice of our high priest Jesus Christ. But now what we have, we're in the temple of heaven and out of the temple of heaven come angels that are bringing wrath out of the temple with the bowls. So something's going on. Let's keep reading. Verse 8. And the temple was filled with the smoke from God's glory and power. And then this, I put it in red because it just kind of jumped out. No one could do what? No one could enter the temple until the seven angels had completed pouring out the seven plagues. So here's what we... I, I'm just logic. Logic, I would say this. If no one could enter into the temple, then that must mean neither can Jesus. So that Jesus, who serves in this temple, for a moment in time has been taken out of that temple so that he no longer serves as the high priest to make intercession of the sins of humanity and he's now 
not allowed in that temple as the high priest. And now the wrath can be taken out of that temple, given to the angels to be poured out because the mediator has been stepped aside for a moment. So if nobody can enter, that would logically tell me that Jesus himself is not allowed to go in and make intercession for the sins of humans. Because right now, my opinion, right now the only reason you are not annihilated off this planet by a holy God is there is a Jewish God named Jesus Christ who is sitting in the tabernacle of heaven ever living to make intercession for you with His blood so that you are totally forgiven because of Him so that the wrath of God will not touch you and He ever lives to make that sacrifice of intercession of His blood once and for everybody. But in this moment, it seems like nobody's allowed to enter. And then out of it comes this wrath of God. Here's Hebrews, uh, just to show you what I'm thinking. Here is the main point. We have a high priest. It's Jesus, still very Jewish, who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. There he ministers where? He ministers in the heavenly tabernacle. So when it says no one was allowed to go in it, and yet Hebrews says that Jesus is ministering in it, it seemingly tells me that the the, the, the ministry of Jesus as the intercessor for the sins of humanity is staved off so wrath can be poured out on humanity because we've rejected him. All right? Then it goes on in Hebrews 9. So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven. Again, it tells us that Jesus is in the tabernacle in heaven which was not made by human hands or part of this created world. He did it with his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once for all time. And what did he do there? He secured our redemption forever. So that means in this tabernacle where he gave his blood, there's something that happened that caused the Father to back off and not bring wrath because it was staved off by the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ who lives to minister in this tabernacle. I, it's weird. I know like we just see Jesus up there like just sitting. Like biting his nails like, well, I guess I'll go back next week. I don't know. Only daddy knows. I, don't know. I might go down there and say hello to him. I don't know. I think they're having revival. Like that's kind of the thought we have of Jesus. Like he's just sitting up there biting his nails waiting on daddy to go, go get him, boys. But what I read in Hebrews is he's active. He ever lives to intercede for me to, before the throne of God on my behalf. That means he goes into this tabernacle and he walks in and he says, Father God, Mark, bless his heart, he's blown it again. But he has come to me and he has given me the sins and I present them before you. And I call him totally clean and totally forgiven. And that you hold nothing against him because I hold nothing against him. This is the Jesus that we have. He's not just up there taking a nap. He ever lives to intercede in this heavenly tabernacle, which is weird, right? Like there's, there's that kind of stuff going on in heaven. It goes on to say this, Hebrews 9, 15. This is why he, Jesus, is the one who does what? Mediates. He mediates a new covenant between who? God between God and people. <laughs> So if you remove him out of this moment of time in heaven, if the Father says to the Son, you're not allowed in the temple right now, and then out of the temple come the, the beings that give the wrath out, and now the wrath can be poured out because the mediator between God and people has been held off for a moment. In other words, the best way I could define it, and this may sound weird to you, I'd ask you to study it out yourself as well, the best I could define it is the season of grace is postponed for a while so that wrath can be poured out. The only reason you're not dead now is grace. <laughs> we sing an amazing grace, how sweet the sound. But that's because Jesus is mediating between God and us. Otherwise, God would just kill us all. He's so holy. His holiness would just obliterate us. But, but Jesus intercedes and it says so that all who are called can receive an internal inheritance 
God has promised them, for Christ died to set them free, and then it even tags this in, from the penalty of sin, and then even goes further to show it's also about the Jew, from the, the, the acts committed where? The first covenant. Pointing all the way back to the Old Testament. Uh, again, showing that there's this activity going on that people who break the law, who've never been born again, who are trying to earn God's favor by doing good stuff, that, that they have a penalty on them. And right now, that penalty, the reason, the reason sin it just seems like, oh man, everybody's going nuts today and everybody's getting away with it, is because the penalty of their sins right now is being held off because of the intercession of Jesus mediating. But we're coming to a period of time where I believe no one will be allowed to go into the temple. And somehow the father will say to the son, son, not right now. Because now it's time to pour the wrath out on those that have rejected your mediation. And he begins to pour it out. Which is why we would say Jesus is the only way to be saved. Because he's the mediator. There is no other way to go before God except Jesus. can't do it through popes, priests, preachers. It's only Jesus. Amen. Hebrews 9.27 And just as each person is destined to die once, and then, here we go again, judgment. So also Christ was offered once for an all-time sacrifice to take away the sins of people. He will come again, but not to deal with sins, but to bring salvation for those that are eagerly waiting. Again, he shows us this, this tabernacle ministry of Jesus is connected to the judgment that we all deserve. But he's coming one more time, and when he comes then, it's to bring us salvation. So here's my thought. It's just a thought. No one is allowed to enter the temple, according to what we read in the Scripture, and this was the thought that I, it came out of that. Hence, the work of Christ as mediator is halted in order for judgment to be brought upon sinful humanity. I go back to why the church is so important. The church right now is so important because we're pushing people to believe in Jesus so that they miss this judgment. Because right now, judgment is being halted because of Jesus Christ. And you have an opportunity to believe and to miss that judgment. But if you reject it, this is kind of the thing. Well, here are the judgments... I've already taught on this once before, way back when, but I want to run through the seven bold judgments with you. I didn't even put them on your sheet, but if you want to write them on the back, you can. And they're pretty, you read them, I mean, they're pretty simply right there in front of us. But here they are just so you can see them, because I'd like to kind of end with some thoughts that are, go beyond this that you can just read. Uh, the first plague poured out once the wrath is done is foul and malignant sores on those that bear the mark. The second plague is all seawater is turned to blood. So all of the oceans of the world are turned to blood, which really presents major problems we've talked about before with rain, lack of water, death. Uh, so once we're at plague two, we're probably about one week left on planet Earth because you can't make more than probably about a week without water. So... Go quite a while without food, but not too long without water. And, and if there's no seawater, there's no condensation, and there's no rain. And if there's no rain, there's no rivers. And so you pretty much just end up with everything starting to die quickly. Plague three, all fresh water turns to blood. So there's no drinking. So once there's no drinking, what you're reading now, we're down to about a week. A week left before Christ returns. The remaining people that are left on the earth will be scorched by the sun. Plague five, darkness and sores on Satan's kingdom. Now the next two are interesting. We didn't talk about this before. Uh, but they're very interesting because they're, they're counted as bold judgments. But they, they do something very significant is that they release the, the plan of Satan's kingdom to start moving forward to work his work so that he too can be judged. So these last two plagues do something very significant. They release demonic spirits that prepare the kings of the world for war. So this final war will not just be Syria got ticked at Israel and Iran got ticked at Iraq and they start blowing each other up. This final war is because demons have been released that will go and torment and lead people to go annihilate the Jews. 
So it'll be a very demonic thing. But there's uh, the, the sixth plague releases these demonic spirits. And these demonic spirits will heighten everything up. And then plague seven, all of the earth is utterly shaken. And so those are the seven plagues. Let's go uh, read it real quickly. In Revelation 16, I just pulled out some scriptures that I think will be more meaningful and kind of give you some insight. The sixth angel poured out his bowl. Here's, here's bowl six and seven. On the great river Euphrates... And it dried up so that the kings of the east could march their armies toward the west without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap out of the mouth of the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles. And they go out to all the rulers of the world. And here's what they're going to do. They're going to gather these rulers of the world for battle against God. And then here again on the judgment day. So it's that close. There's a day of judgment coming. But this plague releases these demons that will gather all the armies of the world together and start marching toward Jerusalem to take them out. Now here is, we go way back. Remember like lesson two and three. This is the promised land of God. And when he speaks and says the river Euphrates is going to dry up, This was the land we talked about that God gave to Abraham and made a promise. It's there today. There's all the nations of today that are there in 2021. Uh, Here is the great river Euphrates, so you can see how real it becomes. Um, The great river Euphrates basically just splits Iraq right in two. And we're going to look at, when we start studying Babylon, the, the old ancient city of Babylon sat on the west east side of that river so when it says that the the angel releases uh, the bowl that dries this river up so that these uh, armies can come against down there in the corner I'll put this one up kind of show you a little better there's the land of promise there's the river Euphrates that's going to dry up so what it's going to tell me is obviously Uh, nations from Iraq, Iran, uh, uh, off into Russia, China, all of those nations that are on that side of the Euphrates cannot come and attack Israel until the Euphrates is dried up. And so to, to hasten this judgment, God, in a weird way, dries it up. And the moment it's dried up, demons come and gather all these nations and go, let's go kill them, boys. And they start marching. Here's a thought for you. This shows you that it's not going to be naval warfare or submarines or rockets or airplanes. Because you don't need a river to dry up to go to war. The reason the river has to dry up is no ships can sail because everything's blood. No submarines can go because everything's blood. There are no warheads because they've all been blown up with earthquakes and everything that's happened. There are no airplanes that can fly because there's no fuel left. There's nothing left on planet Earth. We're back to Neanderthal hand-to-hand combat. That's about all we have left. And so the river Euphrates has to dry up because everybody is in horse and buggy days now. There's nothing left. You know, we had this picture, there's going to be nuclear war and bombs and airplanes. If that's true, then the river doesn't need to dry up. Just get in a plane, go bomb them. That's what they're doing now. So this war is going to be different. It's not going to be them bombing and them launching rockets from Syria into Lebanon and and Israel. It's going to be this river drying up and then the demons gathering all of these nations to come and to begin to march on the river Euphrates. Here's a scripture. Revelation 6. Look, I'll come unexpectedly. Blessed are all those who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so they'll not have to walk around naked and ashamed. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers. And you've probably heard this phrase a lot. They gathered their armies to a place with the Hebrew name what? Yeah, the Hebrew name Armageddon. Here here is Armageddon for you. There's several movies out there about it. There's several kind of, you know, a lot of books written about it. But this is what it is. 
It's the valley, the Jezreel Valley, also known as the Valley of Megiddo, which takes its name from the ancient city Jezreel, which was located on a low hill overlooking the southern edge of the valley. The word Jezreel comes from the Hebrew word, which means God sows. So this final war, when they march over the river Euphrates, they're going to settle themselves in the Jezreel Valley. All of these armies are going to march across Iraq, march across the top of Syria, and come down from the north of Israel, in the land of Israel. All these armies will start coming down from the north, marching on Israel and the capital at Jerusalem to take it over. And they're going to settle in the land of Armageddon. Just so you understand why that's important, the Valley of Jezreel, here's an old uh, prophet, Hosea. Hosea married Gomer, the daughter of Dibleim, and she became pregnant and gave Hosea a son. And Now this is from uh, the son of a prostitute. And the Lord said, name the child what? Jezreel. Name him Jezreel, for I'm going to do what? Punish. I'm going to punish him. I'm going to avenge the murder. I'm going to bring an end to the military power. So this valley where all these kings are going to meet is already connected to a prophecy of God avenging the rebellion of his nation and God putting an end to all of Israel's independence. In other words, they're going to finally, once and for all, realize they need God and they need the Messiah because the armies are going to be piling in from the north and they're going to realize we cannot be independent, we need a Messiah. Chapters ahead, that's where Jesus comes and shows up in his second coming and begins to defeat them. Uh, here's the best way I can define it for you. There is uh, the modern day Iraq. Uh, I put red there because that's modern day Baghdad, which is kind of next to the old Babylon of Bible days. And if you notice, running all the way up is what river? It's a river Euphrates. My belief, and I'll teach this as we go ahead, my belief is that the kingdom of Satan will be headquartered somewhere around Baghdad in the old city of Babylon because that was the headquarter of all demonic power back in the book of Genesis. And I believe Satan is going to try to once again rule and reign from there. So there's a lot going on in Iraq right now, so keep your, keep your nose to the grind. And all of those nations, Iraq, Israel, Lebanon, I mean, Jordan, they all hate Israel. And when these armies march, I gave you the, the mark there, that's the Valley of Jezreel. So once the Euphrates River dries up, because of the demonic spirits that begin to speak to all these kings and rulers, they're going to gather together, they're going to march across the plain, they're going to, to my belief, they're going to come down through the top of Syria, Lebanon, they're going to work their way from the north of the land of Israel, and they're going to settle in this valley called the Valley of Megiddo. And all of these armies will, will be sitting right on the northern side of Jerusalem getting ready to annihilate and kill every single Jew. But the plan is God has got them all together because he's about to nuke them all. Jesus is going to return and once he's going to put an end to all the Gentile powers. But that's, that's the trek that they're going to make as they begin to marshal their armies together to cross the Euphrates. Here it is blown up a little bigger. You can see the city of Nazareth where Jesus lived. Megiddo is just sort of southwest of Jesus' hometown. So Jesus is kind of coming back home, amen, uh, when he comes and he begins to do. But there's the West Bank. There's the Jordan River of Bible times. And, of course, south would be Jerusalem. Here is a modern-day picture of the Valley of Megiddo. This is right outside of Israel where these nations will gather. Could you imagine a million plus some odd millions upon millions of soldiers standing out there to take this little nation of Israel over? And this is where the bloodshed of all of them will be done away with. Here's another picture of the plains of Megiddo. So all of this is already in preparation now. It's there. It exists. It's not just some uh, mystic fable. This land is already there, it's already been prophesied, and it's already waiting. And this is the area where all of the nations will gather together to overthrow the Jews. Let's end it with Revelation 16. The seventh angel poured out his bowl. The voice, the air, and a loud voice came out of where? It came out of the temple of heaven and the throne saying, It is done.
And there were noises and thunders and lightnings and a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake that had not ever occurred since there were men upon the earth. Now the great city, and this is where we're going next week to talk about this city of Babylon, mystery Babylon, the harlot. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon was remembered before God. And here it is, to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Great hell from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent, which is 75 pounds. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hell. And that plague was exceedingly great. And this leads us up to the final days, maybe weeks, before the second coming of Christ to come as the Messiah to the Jews that are being annihilated. But I, I wanted to leave you with a thought of why this wrath and how it plays itself out. So I hope that blessed you. I hope you learned something tonight. I hope it challenged you to study a little bit more. Thank you so much for joining us on the Believer's Church YouTube channel. If you would like more information about Believer's Church, you can visit mybelieverschurch.com. If there is anything that you need prayer for, please email us at amen at mybelieverschurch.com. Be sure to check back next week for a brand new message.